my name is Hisham. I'm joined by Josh, Shreyash, and Hannah from Team Ripple, and we're proud to invite uh, Michael Russell of uh, the NBA uh, Global Partnerships to uh, come speak with us on his experience uh, within NBA, uh, journeying from an uh, uh, undergraduate degree in public policy to where he is right now with Global Partnerships. Um, and yeah, we can go, we can dive right into it. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, uh, for joining us today. Uh, how have you been and uh, what, what have you sort of been up to the past couple months? I've uh, been good, man. I'm uh, still in New York City, um, where NBA is based out of, based out of uh, New York City. So staying safe here. Um, New York's been pretty um, slow moving in terms of opening, which I appreciate. I, I don't mind. But, uh, but as you can imagine, going on day 100 plus, I guess, whatever it is, going a little stir crazy in my New York City apartment. But uh, we're doing well. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, uh, ever since uh, uh, COVID hit, I'm sure you've been working from home. Uh, has, has that been a change of pace for the kind of stuff that you've been working on? Uh, have you have you had to like redirect the kind of uh, just the stuff that you've been working on in general? Yeah, no, uh, good question. Um, it has obviously changed the dynamic of everything. Now we're all on Zoom calls and WebEx calls or whatever it may be. Um, I think now specifically with my role, a lot of it has been, well, my role in general is focused on the sales side, partnership side of the NBA. So a lot of people, a lot of companies aren't spending that much right now, given that obviously they've had a huge financial impact and financial hit. So, um, so we're not that focused on getting money from partners right away and trying to get deals done. It's more being proactive. Okay, when we get back to some sort of normalcy, whatever that time may be, what can we hit the ground running with? So it's been a lot of developing proposals, ideas, pitches that uh, resonate a little bit more once once companies actually have money, right? No, definitely, yeah. Uh, so uh, speaking on that, could you just give a little bit of context of, of what your role is with global partnerships? Uh, just it's like just for the people who don't really have too much experience on like what the NBA does with their global partners and what their goal is with this kind of role. For sure, for sure. So I'm in global partnerships, but specifically uh, on the new business development team. So essentially what we do is serve as the sales arm of the organization. So we're the ones that go out and do the deals with the state farms, the Nike trades. We're the ones that secure those partnerships. And so it's everything from the ideation, building out the creative, and figuring out what's the synergy for us and or X brand, whatever it may be. Um, so, uh, so that's 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 really what we're focused on. We're the ones that that help push uh, a lot of the revenue to the NBA with these partnerships that obviously happen domestically, but as well as globally um, in our different regions, our different regional offices. And um, that's ultimately what, uh, what what we focus on. No, that's awesome. It's really because I know um, I just, I grew up watching the NBA, uh, and I have cousins in um, in in Asia, and they as well watch, and are always um, up to date with NBA. So I know it's like one of the most premier uh, global platforms. So, yeah. uh, and partly due to just the partners that you guys have and the establishment that you guys have had in Asia, especially as well as Africa. So it's great to see that you're continuously doing this and continually like finding new partners and new ways to expand the brand of NBA. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, uh, throw out real quick um, for, uh, for anyone on the call um, throughout the call, if you have any questions or anything and you want to chime in, uh, just type in the chat and um, we can go ahead and pass you the mic um, as done as, as soon as we're done with the current talking point. Uh, this is more so a discussion amongst uh, everyone on, on the call rather than just the interview. So yeah, yeah I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, but I, I I was really curious to see uh, what kind of uh, like what kinds of um, work uh, NBA has been doing to maintain its like relevancy, especially amongst um, COVID nineteen. Because uh, I'm like uh, as obviously like you guys aren't continuing the games uh, currently. So how have you guys been able to maintain the brand and stay uh, in stay relevant in people's minds uh, even without the games going on? Yeah. Um, well, especially given the past couple. Of weeks, um, the NBA has always been a, a brand and a company that has stood on social justice issues. So right now, obviously, given the environment, it's a lot bigger than basketball. Not only our players, I know LeBron, of course, the player in, in, in all of basketball and one of the 
most recognizable athletes in all the sports has, um, has, has made his stance. I think now we've tried to utilize our platform in the time that we've been off to help promote um, social, so address social inequalities, um, racial injustices, et cetera. Um, and I, I, I think that's one of the things that we can use our platform as sports to do. Uh, I think on the business side, um, we tried to continue to engage partners and let them know that there is a restart coming. Um, and so we've like, for example, we really starting to engage a lot of like cleaning product type companies to help with standardization and restart of things, and how they can play a role in making it a just a safer environment for all people that are that are involved. So, um, so that's something that we focused like hyper focused on um, business wise to help kind of bring the partnership to life in that space and so win win right. They get brain recognition. We also help our, uh, players and the people in that Orlando bubble uh, safer. No, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it's curious to see how you guys have been kind of shifting your partners to uh, help your own like your own game as well as like help the companies that are working towards like preventing COVID uh, yeah. spread. Do you see that continuing beyond like the COVID epidemic? Do you guys see yourself continuing these relationships with these kinds of uh, brands and uh, industries? Yeah, uh, I definitely. Um, I think that. As we go forward, the sports, the world will change as we know it, period, given this um, pandemic. So there's going to be alterations that are going to need to be made for all the arenas nationwide, um, for all the arenas that we go to, player international, whatnot. Um, so I, I, I think these type of partnerships will continue. A lot of the things that we're doing right now are focused on, okay, let's kind of do a trial period, see how it looks. And then as we dive back into or normalcy for, uh, for, uh, for lack of a better word, when we start back up, uh, what that looks like, and then what it looks like with fans, right? It's one thing, it's one thing dealing with these partners and, and trying to make their arenas right for just the players. It's another thing by having upwards of 30, 40,000 people back in there, right? So, um, so I, I definitely do think that these partnerships will continue. I think this is something that, uh, that will continue have dialogue around and um also just try to try to make the venue safe i think also trying to figure out the best way to do that and each sports faces different challenges and um that's something obviously that we're still working on. no it's definitely true uh, i think like covid is gonna like the like the pandemic won't stay but the impact uh, the cultural impact that it, it's had on society is definitely going to persist Hope for generations in regards to like how clean we are, like the way we interact amongst uh, people in, especially some like venues such as stadiums and stuff. So it's interesting to see how interesting to see how the NBA is going about that with their brands. Um, yeah. uh, so you mentioned earlier how like uh, you have players like LeBron and uh, Steph Curry who are like always like standing up for these social justice issues, um, and uh, particularly with the NBA restarting or like continuing a season uh, in Orlando. But there's been a lot of um, talk around should they restart and should they not restart, especially amongst the NBA players. Have you guys, how have you guys gone about that? Because um, I know like there's one side with LeBron who is saying like the, this is a this is a great chance to bring light to a lot of the like the BLM movement um, through basketball. Another another side that's saying this is going to be a distraction to the BLM movement, um, as well as like the whole convers um, uh, conversation on the COVID impact. So how how has NBA kind of addressed that and is continuing to address that uh, moving forward? Yeah, so um, so so one of the things that we've done is we said, look, we stand behind any players that don't want to play right now because they feel like this is not the proper time to do so. So um, they will choose not to play, um, and others that do play, we've obviously we've we've been in the works just internally of trying to figure out what are the best ways as a league we can help support and promote these messages that these players want to come out and say, display, whatever it may be. Um, so, so that's something internally, like we're, we're, we're still working on. Um, the season will be kicking off July 31st, July 30th, um, yeah. last I heard. So we still have, a, we still have over a month to kind of figure it all out. And of course it's all re react, right? Like this is all reactionary given yeah. what's, what's, what's going on in our environment. Um, but 
the NBA has, has always been a place that's a, that, that's allowed players to to make a stand and, 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 and speak their truth. There's never been a player that's been fined for speaking out on social issues or been suspended over talking about social issues. So as, as a league, what we're trying to do is help give them a stage to say what they need to say and prepare to go to this right time. Again, they're not being suspended. They're not being punished. That's something that they feel is the right thing to do. We are 1,000 fine. on that topic is um, prior to uh, this past season starting, there was a tweet that um, Daryl Morey had tweeted uh, uh, talking about um, the Hong Kong riots. And that led to another whole storm on how the NBA should address its uh, stance on global issues, especially with one of its biggest markets in China um, and he, the Houston Rockets being uh, the biggest be uh, uh, benefactory of that. So how did how did you and the global partnerships uh, team like kind of address that? Because I'm sure it was a big hit on the business that you guys were receiving from the Chinese markets. Yeah, it was it was it, it was a big hit um, to to our organization. China is the biggest revenue generator outside of the USA for us, um, and it's tough, right? Because you reach a slippery slope in terms of deciding what your social justice to what. Um, issues are worthy of speaking up on or not. You can't really effectively do that. Um, I think one of the things that Adam Silver has done, our commissioner, he's one of the greatest leaders that I have, I have seen or interacted with in any capacity. And I think he's, um, he's, he's taken this in stride and trying to balance, obviously, our relationship with China, which has different governments set up than we do here in the USA. But of course, they have a plethora of, of, blas of, of basketball fans. But the game, as you mentioned, the Rockets, Yao Ming kind of helped kind of pull uh, our, our, our popularity there. Um, but I, I, I think it's something that Adam and, and the owners will have to continue to address. It's a, it, it's a fine line, again, right? Like trying to figure out what you can police effectively and what you can't. And Daryl Morey spoke his mind uh, on behalf whether intentionally or not, of the NBA in that, uh, in, in that aspect of our business. So I, I think now they're just trying to figure out kind of what's the best protocol going forward for, for, for anything such as that. Because you don't, I mean, of course, we can't we can't squash free speech, right? Yeah. You know, it's, just, it's just trying to figure out that balance of what to say, how to say it, whatever it may be. So, um, so that's that's something that, fortunately, is, is above my pay grade, and I don't get paid to uh, talk <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, but it's it's really interesting because um, I kind of wanted to have this be a segue to your uh, undergraduate experience because you um, said that you focused heavily on um, public policy. You graduated with a public policy degree. And it's interesting that you work in a role that's primarily business focused, but there's so much social impact. There's so much cultural impact, both domestically and um, globally, that's uh, involved in the kind of business that you guys are doing. So yeah. I was just, um, I was going to ask, like, what kind of, like policy work, have you been able to in implement into your uh, daily work with the NBA? Um, that's a good question. I think now more than ever, again, um, as a black man in America and as a black man working at the NBA, and I am of our sales organization, I'm the only black person in the group. So wow. not, not that I'm enacting policy, but um, anytime you're talking about social justice, racial inequality, um, focusing on underserved or minority communities, I think policy has a little bit of an impact there. Um, I think also too, being a league that's 75% black, right? Like I'm helping sell partnerships and sponsorships that are part of a league that reflects people who look like me, but that's not necessarily the case for our entire organization. So I think now I've used policy to help remind people how we got here, right? So different laws that were put in place back in 40s, 50s, 60s, been way before then. Um, and, and, and that, I think, um, has, has quite honestly been, uh, been the most where I've used my policy degree and policy background. But I think, too, one of the things you learn in 
any any type of realm of studying public policy is understanding both sides, right? Or, or all sides that come to the table. And I think that's just a diplomatic way to approach things. And I think that's that basis and that background helped me think through a lot of different things that I that I that I do in, in, in my life. And with, with anything policy related, there's especially here in America, we have two sides of things, right? And they're pretty staunchly entrenched whatever they believe in. So it's so it's taking a step back and they're saying, okay, what this side thinks, what this side thinks, and then figuring out what's the best course of action. And I think that helps anything that I do with no, that's definitely true. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting because you've been able to get so much of your, um, maybe not the technical skills, but a lot of interpersonal skills to almost any, uh, as you said, you kind of showed that through uh, the NBA work that you've done. Yeah. Uh, this one. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so then uh, I was just kind of curious on you. So you before this global partnerships uh, work that you're currently doing, you you had a two year rotational program um, right after your um, graduation from UVA. So what kind of work were you doing in that that kind of led you to your current role with global partnerships? Yeah. So uh, while I was at UVA, I was actually studying abroad the first semester of my fourth year. I was studying abroad in Florence. I was like, I have no idea what the hell I wanted. <laughs> Uh, like I'm, a, I'm a big fan of sports. Um, always have been. So I was looking at like NBA, NFL, MLB, like ESPN, those sports companies. Coming upon this opportunity at the NBA um, for the associate program. So essentially, what it is, it's a two-year rotational program. It's four six-month assignments in the department. Yeah, and um, I was interested in that because I didn't know what it was like work in sports, um, and also didn't even know what departments even really meant. And what their functionality were. So, uh, so that's cool. I can kind of learn what I want to do as I'm working there and then ultimately end up where I want to end up full time. So, fortunate enough, got the job and um, I rotated through four different departments. One was content, which specifically original production, which focused a lot of like behind the scenes stuff that you get. So, like players in locker rooms, content in like practices, like stuff you don't see during the right? Players going back to their hometowns, visiting, whatever it may be. Yeah. And then secondly, I went into junior NBA basketball development. So that focused on all of our initiatives that we're trying to do, promote um, work that we're doing in the youth space and getting more kids playing basketball. And when I came into my third rotation, which is in global partnerships, which is the in partnership development, which is the group that I just recently left. Um, when I originally started as a big basketball fan, I wanted no parts of the business side at all. I was like, look, put me close to the game. I want to be in like basketball operations, player development, be around the players. And um, the lady who ran our program, she was like, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to put you in March. I was like, you clearly didn't hear anything I just said to you a year ago and over the course of this year where I said, put me in finance and be detrimental to both sides. We don't want that. Put me in global partnerships. I don't want to be a part of the side. I want to strictly be on the basketball side. Um, but coincidentally, Group that I went into, the head of my group went to you. He was a cross player back in the day. And so like we just connected just off the UVA experience. And she's like, look, I know Rob will look after you. He'll make sure you're good. I was like, all right, whatever. As long as you put me in the department that I want to be in for my, for my fourth rotation. It's like, cool, I got it. So I went through the six months. It's like, cool, whatever. Forget global partnership. I was learning a lot. And I was like, wow, I'm actually, this actually isn't half bad. It's like, I really want to be in player development. So my fourth rotation, was in player development, which player development deals with all the off-court development for the players. So everything for helping them understand money, helping them, helping them with their mental health and wellness, which is a big thing just across the country in general, but especially in the athletic sphere. Um, yeah. Talking alcohol policy, how to dress going to events. I mean, we're talking about helping transition guys from amateurs to now professionals, helping them continue to build their brand, whatever it may be. So I love that. And... Ultimately, when I left out of the program, I was deciding between the position I'm in now for player development. And I just thought what would help better myself long term, give me more transferable skills, which was being on the, at the time, before, being on the business side of a multi-billion dollar organization, I thought set me up for more success long term than 
players. I don't want to be in basketball forever. So, but I tell people all the time, it's like, would I have more fun playing, which I've done, would I have more fun playing NBA 2K with Trey Young and Luka Doncic as opposed to building a deck for Duracell? Obviously, the former. What? That's great. I'll do that every day of the week, right? Yeah. But like, what's bettering me long term and helping me? build on my foundation and build on my successes it's it's going back to global partnerships so never in a million years that i think i was going to be on the business side of things and here i am helping sell the game you would have told me that when i was sitting at uva i would have been like you're after <laughs> here we are now that's actually so interesting that uh you kind of had like you're like exactly what you wanted and then like something that you didn't really expect that you would end up going towards and you chose that because you were thinking long term um and it, it I mean it's really great advice that like sometimes you have to think logically uh the the world isn't all cookies and cookies and rainbows you want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for the most success down down the line yeah for sure uh yeah uh, so someone uh just asked a question actually in the chat that I want to bring up cool uh most rewarding experience so far what's been our most rewarding experience uh, honestly I would say it's going to my first all-star um, all-star is our big marquee event that's where we have the most people who are hands on the ground um, ready to go and ready to work and going to all-star it was 2017 in New Orleans and I remember when I Landed, got in my taxi, all the times, All-Star 2017, whatever, whatever. Um, I teared up. I was like, this is crazy. As a big basketball, big a basketball fan as I've been my entire life, I'm getting paid <laughs> to work at All-Star game was crazy to me. And that was just, uh, that was, like, obviously when I got the job, and I'll tell y'all, when I got the job, uh, it was our first day back in, of classes for second semester. It was January something of 2016. I got, I was expecting to call for a week, whether I got the job or I didn't. I was at Harris Teeter on, in Barracks, yeah. and I was shopping because it was, snow was coming. I was like, shit, like, let me get all the stuff I need to get. And I saw a call from New York number, and I was like, oh, my. My life can change for better or for worse once I hear the end of this call. I answered it. And um, late at the time, my name was Mallory. She was telling me, she's like, hey, like, just want to give you a call. Like, how are you doing? I was like, I'm good. Oh, you started, y'all start class today, right? I was like, yeah. She's asking me all these questions about what classes I'm taking. I'm like, yo, look, let me know if I can get the job or not. I don't want to tell you about my whole entire semester and what I have planned out if I don't get the job. So I remember going over to the uh, wine section in like that back right corner of Harris T. As I got the call, I was like, I somewhere I could be a little bit quieter. And um, she said, look, uh, you did a great job during the interview process. Um, and in my head, I was like, all right, great. So that could say, hey, you did a great job in the interview process, but there's thousands of people that apply for this job. Yeah. You can cut it or it's lit. Get the job. It's great, right? So um, obviously it's ladder. And I remember I immediately went and bought a 12-pack of Corona, <laughs> put it in my cart, went home drank probably six of them, went to my first class. It was like some big lecture. And I was like, look, I have a job, man. It's <laughs> life, life is good. Yeah. Um, but uh, now I'm forgetting why I even went down that path of the original question. What was the original question again? It was uh, your most rewarding NBA experience. Oh, yeah. So so I, I, I thought, so like that was that was the most rewarding thing at that time, right? And it, it like, it, it was like, cool, like I have a job at the NBA, it's great. But being there and then ultimately going to my all-star, I was like, wow, this is real. Like I'm big. This is absolutely incredible. And that was, that's still to this day. I mean, like, like your first time you do anything, right? It's like, wow, like I'm actually doing this. This is dope. This is great. And uh, I've been to multiple all-stars after, but that first one just hit different. different. Yeah. It's funny. Uh, I, uh, my freshman year of high school, the all-star game was happening in Houston, where uh, I currently am right now. 06, 06, 07? No, this was um, like eight years ago. So 2012, 2013. Okay. Yeah, uh, oh, that's right. That's right. That went to my first All Star. It was in Houston. It was like 2007. And we yeah, that. yeah. And I remember I paid like 20. I paid like I think 25, 30 dollars for the NBA, um, like the jam session. The jam session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, stuff. and it was such yep. a surreal experience. I can't imagine actually getting paid to go like 
go through that. Yeah, or, or working something like that, right? Like yeah. stuff that I that my parents paid for me to go to, now they're paying for me to work at. It, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, I'm sure, a surreal experience. Uh, so Varun actually has two questions. So um, we'll just uh, give the mic to Varun and he can go and uh, go ahead and ask that. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for being here. And so I have, I, so I guess like my first question is, um, I was wondering what did you do like at UVA that like might have helped you like in you know, like your career so far? Yeah, um, one of the things that I pitched like going into this program is you're obviously rotating through different departments so they look for people who can easily adapt or have skills that are transferable so one of the things I pitched at Batten going through Batten is hey I did everything from public speaking to doing research and data analysis to working in groups all the time for projects and trying to show that hey I've had all these different experiences this applies and then two I mean just doing other things like in the Charlottesville community like I've I volunteered um, for a couple of different middle schools in the area. I coached for a boys and girls basketball team. Um, just trying to do stuff like outside of quote unquote normal college experience. I, I played club basketball. They're like, look, you're not playing at the work at the day, so we don't care about your basketball skills. <laughs> but like obviously diversifying the things that I was doing across the board. Try to face like, hey, you put me in an environment. I have skills that I can pull upon of things that I've done that that can be applicable to whatever role you put me in. So that was kind of the thing, like just the interdisciplinary background that uh, that that I had um, that I was really trying to trying to push for. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And um, so, I, like, my second question: I know if uh, like, so I'm a huge fan of like the NBA G League actually. So I follow oh, that, and I know. Oh, um, like with Mexico City, I think, or in Mexico, mm -hmm. there's going to be a new yeah, team. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was kind of wondering, like, if, like, you had to, like, do anything in terms of, like, that, in terms of, like, you know, your work, or if you know, like, because I, I don't know if that's, like, how that's going to work also with, like, COVID, if that's going to impact. Working them. on that G League team specifically, or just the G League in general? Yeah, I guess, like, um, I mean, if you've, like, had to, like, also expand, like, because of the announcement to Mexico, if, like, you, you're, you've had to work with partners on, like, trying to help that team. Um, yeah. No, good, good question. I haven't worked specifically on our um, new franchise that we're going to have in Mexico. Um, this doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it's really related. One thing that I've actually been working on a lot is our new G League team that we have opened to high schoolers like Jalen Green who's the number one player in the country by ESPN um, is now going to be joining this new team don't have a name for it quite yet um, but we have Kai Soto who's from the Philippines um, I'm forgetting that we have we have four top-notch high school players who are now foregoing college to come to our G League pathway program that they're going to play a year and then ultimately able to be compensated for it like Jalen Green instead of going to UVA let's say and I would love for him to go to UVA but been able to another national championship but um obviously he'll he'll he'll, he'll be with uh with us but um they'll be able to monetize themselves and making upwards of five hundred thousand dollars as a 18 19 he wouldn't have been able to do otherwise be able to sign endorsements etc but I've been working a lot on that and how we can integrate partners within that and if like for example for this new team with like a partner so you see, if any of you all are soccer fans, you'll see like Chelsea or Real Madrid, Barcelona, whatever, Rakuten have their like primary logo, like right, like similar, like this ATL, like it would be on their jersey. So yeah. we're talking to partners, like potentially doing that for jerseys, um, talking about partners, just having access to different players and doing certain content shoots, whatever it may be. So I've, I've been doing a lot of that on the G League front, just haven't been doing that much on the uh, Mexico City front. That's very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. No problem. Also, too, like our we we have an office in Mexico, and so they've been doing a lot of the groundwork on that because, of course, they know the partners in that area. They know the ecosystem. They know the dynamics. That me sitting in on the twenty first floor of a New York City high rise building don't know. Um, so they they they've kind of been leading the charge on that. I know. I'm like staying on that topic. Um, I know we mentioned earlier how like uh, the NBA has such a um, such a strong presence in 
countries like China, uh, and partly it's due to players like Yao Ming and even like Jeremy Lin. Um, and mm -hmm. I know a couple years ago there was a player from India, Sim Balar, who uh, was like who joined the Kings, but um, he did his career didn't pan out um, mm -hmm. with the NBA. So are there current are there like certain um, geographic regions that, you, that your team is trying to access with the NBA? Maybe it's in Mexico, India, um, other areas in the world that you guys are hoping to establish the NBA brand. Yeah, I mean, India is that, right? Um, India is is first on the list. I mean, we're talking about almost a third of the world's population, right, in, in one country alone. Um, so the impact that, they, and, and as those are familiar with the, the Indian sports economy, I mean, we're talking about the top 10 sports in India are cricket, 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 and then maybe soccer in there, right? So we're obviously trying to break into that market and, and put basketball there. But the interesting question that you asked, right? China was primed a little bit for this basketball infatuation, and basketball leagues had already been there prior to Yao Ming coming to the NBA, whereas big basketball ecosystems exist in India. So we ask ourselves all the time, right? If we had the Indian version of Yao Ming, would Indian people really attach to it as much as Chinese people? We don't know, right? Because we haven't had that quite yet. So yeah. um, India is a huge market that we're trying to break into. We have these things called basketball academies. So we have, I think now, like globally, we have like three in Australia, two in India, three in China, one in Mexico, um, one in Africa and Senegal, I believe, where we're helping bring the best talent in that in said continent or country, um, given where we are, uh, into this ecosystem and help pair them with top basketball coaches, talent, et cetera, to help them ultimately get to the, uh, to the NBA, ideally, or to top schools and give them access to great education, whatever it may be. Um, so we have those in India, and we're trying to help build that ecosystem there. Um, but again, like I said, it, it's tough just because basketball isn't endemic to Indian culture, from what I understand and, yeah. and, 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 and what I've read. Um, and then secondarily is the continent of Africa. We started our Basketball Africa League that actually got postponed because of COVID. Um, but we started a league in Africa with 18, I believe. I haven't, I haven't worked much on it. Um, that will be the uh, official basketball league of Africa. And it'll have representation across the continent that we're really trying to break through and, and continue to build the popularity of basketball in Africa. We've had incredible players from, from the continent. We've had incredible executives like Masai Ujuri um, from the Toronto Raptors who helped lead them to a championship. You think of like Joel Embiid from Cameroon, who's the best African player in my estimation right now. Um, we, 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 there, there's a rich history in Africa, but we haven't necessarily brought it to their soil as opposed to them enjoying stuff that's happening in America from the NBA. No, that's definitely interesting because um, I know the African presence in the league is just uh, like it's so strong. Um, I know at the All Star Game, you guys have the um, you have like, the World versus the USA uh, Rising Stars Challenge, which is also um, I'm sure a great way to increase like the global brand and increase like the viewership from all these select countries that you guys are trying to access. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, so um, you mentioned this earlier uh, with, I think, Varun's uh, question. Um, so you guys are trying to like develop the, G, uh, the, the developmental league um, as like a, as to compete against, with the NC, against the NCAA. So what kind of work have you done with global partnerships to uh, um, uh, go towards that? Yeah, I mean, so similar to what I mentioned, right? Like trying to secure a sponsorship for the jersey or trying to secure a sponsorship for the name of the team. Um, I think it's it's different just because it's the first ever opportunity, right? Like we've never had this thing has never existed, so it's cool that we're that we can kind of just throw darts at the wall and 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 see what what what, um, what stays. So that's been a, a, a big part of it. And also too, right? Like we're talking about some of our partners, like Nike wants to have access, I imagine, to Jalen Green. Jalen Green could be the next whoever. I mean, he's literally the top player in the country for his age. Um, so what so what access can they have to him? And so we're trying to figure that out again because it's all brand new and fresh. 
Because it could be, let's say, for example, so Nike's the official outfitter of the NBA, G League, WNBA, US, USA Basketball. They, as a partner, have access to Jalen. But what if Jalen signs a deal with Adidas and his official sneaker is Adidas? Then how does Nike navigate that relationship? How does Adidas navigate that relationship, not being the official outfitter? So there's some things that um, that we'll still have to kind of figure out. Uh, but um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg for some of the things that yeah. we're kind of figuring out. I mean, we're, we're, we're figuring out as we go. No, I'm sure uh, it's uh, definitely like a new market that you guys are trying to access. Uh, it's interesting to see how the college league is going to combat um, the NCAA uh, or the NBA G League. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, say that there was uh, another question from the audience, uh, Keenan uh, Besson, who wanted to ask. So we can go ahead and give him the mic. Of course. I like the Nuggets shirt, by the way, my man. Hey, thank you, man. Nuggets rising. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. Jokic, he looks, he looks slim. He's I love. Slim I, I, I was gonna say, I, I love Jokic, man. He's a, he's a, he's a dog. Yeah. You know weight loss? I saw a picture of him. Right. Now, right. <laughs> he looks great. He looks great. Let's. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll see how y'all doing uh, in uh, in Orlando. Listen, man. All I'm saying is people slept on us last year, and I'm <laughs> tough, bro. I mean, I was, I was happy to win a series in, in advance. But like the best thing you. is that no one, no one can say, "Oh, you're bad right now." You know, so like, no, no, that doesn't exist. Bandwagon Nuggets fans. I look, I'm from Atlanta. Bandwagon Hawks fans don't exist either. So, and, I hear like, you. I and for me, like, it's so refreshing having knowing that, like, this is the one team whose front office, like, is intelligent. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm a Giants fan. I'm an Arsenal fan. No one else. Is <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, you're like running such a tight shit, man. Yeah, I, I hear you. Love it. Um. Anyway, so my question for you was, yeah. So outside of basketball, I'm a huge soccer fan, mm-hmm. and I'm half French. I was actually in Paris for a semester abroad just until March. Um, oh, word. So my, my friends, they, you know, they see me wearing a lot of PSG stuff. Mm-hmm. Ask me, oh, so are you a PSG fan? Like, oh, like, you know, it's so easy for them. They win the league every year. Like, you know, all the Qatar money. Like, why do you like PSG? And I explained to them, I'm not a fan of PSG team. Um, I just like the brand. Like, I just, I love PSG the they brand. They got Jumpman. They got Jumpman on the logo, man. So that's why I don't want to talk to them. Right? So like, I remember, it like, I remember it was like 2016, maybe the year before they came out with the partnership. And I got like this Mbappe, his first kit with number 29. Mbappe's my favorite player, by the way. I love it's, Mbappe. And I mean, it helps. He's he on FIFA, he's incredible. But that's oh, that's and also he's, he's cheese, man. <laughs> um, so so I got this Mbappe kit, and this is before this, this is before the Jordan partnership. And it was black and white. And one day I remember I, I put on my black and white Jordans, and I was like, this is the freshest, this has, this just made perfect sense, you know? Yeah. And, and then like a year later, it happens. Yeah. And, this full clan, like, dude, like. This just makes perfect sense. Like seeing the, like a lifestyle brand you created out of PSG and Jordan just made complete sense. And yep. I was wondering if you had any insight into maybe into that partnership in particular, but also I was just curious from the association standpoint, is that something the NBA is looking to do on purpose? It's kind of position itself as a lifestyle lifestyle brand for it? Because I know it's you know obviously bigger than basketball, it's a huge thing you guys are riding. And you know, from a marketing standpoint, also because I'm a marketing concentrator and McIntyre, I just thought about how we I'm curious as to like Obviously, like, you know, Nike and Jordan are very close, like, partners with you guys. Is there, like, an explicit marketing strategy that's, like, collaborated between you two? Like, you guys go out and say, hey, listen, like, do they fill you in when they're going in on a partnership with PSG, for example? I mean, there's so many, there's just so many elements here. I'm just very curious to see, like, how, how that cross-marketing works. Yeah, no, all, all great, great points, right? I mean, yeah. we, we all know now, right, sports is an epicenter of culture. And yeah. so one of the things that I've really been pushing within global partnerships is the creation of this culture deck that we send out to prospective clients. So now a lot of partners come to us because they know the impact that we have on culture. We have more impact on culture, so to speak, than MLS, than the American sports leagues, MLS, NFL, MLB, et cetera. Our players, uh, you, you, is, you can't listen to a Drake song or a Cole song or a Kendrick song without hearing a reference to a basketball player, right? And so that's one of the things that we are trying to push and we're trying to have partnerships in that same vein. So one thing I'll tell you, we just did, because you haven't, you haven't seen it yet because it hasn't happened, but um, you would have if COVID didn't exist. But we did a deal with Louis Vuitton, which obviously isn't necessarily like, okay, that's, that's in the culture fashion space. Yeah. Louis Vuitton, which is crazy. Louis Vuitton is paying us money to be the official trophy case carrier of the Larry O'Brien trophy. So when Adam Silver has the trophy to hand to, like, let's imagine this rewind a year later, a year ago, 
and a Kawhi, you will be opening it up from a Louis Vuitton uh-huh. case that's customly that's custom made for the trophy, and then ultimately hand it to the owner, player, etc. It's like yeah. we're trying to do more deals like that, and we have research around it. Like we have a deal with Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew owns the three point shot in the NBA. So if you watch the All Star Game or All Star Weekend, they they are the sponsor of the three point shot, three point contest. Excuse me. Um, and we do research around it where we found, I think it's 82 or 83 percent, people have said Mountain Dew is more culturally relevant than they thought so before because of their partnership with it. So we do research like that all the time. Of course, that helps us pitch it too, right? It's like, well, people said that Mountain Dew now is 82 percent more relevant. So imagine what it can be for partnership with us, right? So like, that's something we're constantly trying to think of. And as me, a person that consumes the culture right like that consumes everything media fashion music whatever that knows and has his eyes and ears to that i'm trying to bring that more and more to what we're doing as a brand from the sales perspective our players are already in it right like we got dane Lillard rapping right we got kyrie doing uncle drew uh acting right so like our players are in it we have players investing on Andre Iguodala, D. Wade has his own wine cellar. KD is investing. Um, yeah, Devin Wright. And, and yeah, yeah, he just yeah. did MLS. He just did some, yeah. I, I feel it, Philadelphia Union, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So it's like players who are in that space, now we're trying to wrap it all together and put a bow on it as to why it makes sense for a partner to invest less. Because, yes, you can do an individual deal with KD. That's obviously yeah. going to cost a lot of money, just like it would cost a lot of money. But it's bigger than just KD. KD's not the only entrepreneur in the NBA, like we can help give you access to go down the list. So, um, so, so we're trying, like we're actively now trying to do a better job of that, that we haven't done before. And me as a person that can all this shit is trying to do a lot better job of bringing that all together. Yeah. That's so common. I mean, from a global perspective as well, I mean, just thinking about how, like, how you have to export, you want to, you want to export the NBA brand image to all these countries. I feel like, but also you want to maybe adapt a little bit because Louis Vuitton, it's actually really, that's, that's so interesting because I know, like in France specifically, you know, you guys just have your you had your first game in Paris, I think last year, yep. and like just like seeing that come together and seeing like the little like the little adaptation. And, and, and that's and that's where the that's, that's where it was released. That's where yeah. we like we showed it because Louis Vuitton is from. I was out there, I know, man. Of course, is a French brand, but yeah, I, mean, I guess that makes sense. But I just wasn't even thinking that way. <laughs> it's just so cool, man, seeing it how you can like keep the brand keep the brand how it is, but just adapt it to different cultures and you know. It's just awesome. Yeah. And one other thing I'll say, too, is Louis Vuitton, which I didn't know this is being the business, Louis Vuitton yeah. and Moet Hennessy are the same brand. Oh, no, man. So yeah, Moet um, the liquor yeah. are the same brand. And so we, Moet Hennessy is our official spirits partner, I believe, is their designation of the NBA. Yeah. And also, I mean, that, that was the end with Louis Vuitton. But again, like, that talks to culture, right? Like, what does liquor have to do with the NBA? Or you see, like, NFL, like, the Dilly Dilly Bud Light, that has nothing to do yeah. with the game. I it's mean, just like yeah. permeating other sides of yeah. culture. No, it's, it's definitely interesting uh, how you guys are bringing that up because I remember uh, this past All-Star game, uh, you guys, uh, the NBA brought in uh, like a bunch of these TikTok celebrities to um, kind of use them as a platform to like expand the NBA brand uh, towards the TikTok uh, social media. Uh, so are there like certain personalities rather than brands that you guys are also trying to reach out to maybe it's like certain rappers certain actors that you think would be a great um fit for the kind of work that nba is trying to do um for the most part like we've established ourselves on shows on, on social, like i mentioned like we have now i think it's 49 million followers on instagram 40 or 50 million followers on instagram and the next closest is nfl and they're like at 21 um we're the we're the most followed brand on tiktok like our social team, no thanks to me at all. Let's make it very clear. Our social team is crushing it. And so because of that, we have such a huge brand. We don't necessarily need like influencers to help us take take us to the next level. Like you saw at, at All Star, um, we did have them sit courtside and that's obviously great content capture um, for us. But, uh, but yeah, for, for, for the most part, man, like we just rely on the fact that we're covering content of some of the most followed and beloved athletes on the planet and most recognizable, right? Again, like that's what separates us is soccer player. Soccer is the most global sport, period. 
And it's, it's going to take a long time to catch up to that. Hopefully we do, but as of now, we're, we're nowhere close, right? Yeah. And so, like, the Cristiano Ronaldo, the Leo Messi's, the Neymar's, the Mbappe's, Griezmann's, like, those at the top, right? And so those will obviously carry weight across the world. But in the United States of America, like, you don't necessarily know. Like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big Falcons fan from Atlanta. I like to think Julio Jones is the best wide receiver in the NFL. But if Julio Jones walked by you on the street, you probably wouldn't know who the hell he is. But if LeBron walks by you on the street or Steph Curry walks by you on the street, you know who he is. So we're able to leverage that popularity and that notoriety. And um, the ability to just recognize these guys, not even in uniform, holds a lot of weight. Like even somebody is like Tom Brady is, by all accounts, the greatest of all time. You – don't do that. Whoever put that in the chat, don't do that. Um, I had to. I'm not even a Patriots fan. Don't I had to. I had to. <laughs> don't do that. Um, <laughs> I was at that game. I was at the Super Bowl. Oh, really? It was nice in my life. Don't get me started. Um, but Tom Brady, who, if you didn't see him, we have studies to see how many people recognize players in uniform as opposed to out of you. And it's crazy to see the differences between how you recognize Tom Brady in a number 12 uniform for the Patriots, or I guess now the Buccaneers, as opposed to when you would see him just – and, uh, I mean, he just looks like another Brad yeah. or whatever, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's very interesting to see. So, like, we use our brand uh, leverage the amount of popularity that our players have, both on and off the court. And people love now in this day and age, you all are scrolling through Instagram. I'm scrolling through Instagram all the time, right? Or TikTok or Twitter or whatever. And being able to capitalize on finding snackable content on those social media forums is so important. So, the so long story short, we don't really use influencers all that much um, as opposed to just rely on the influencers we currently have, which are the players in the court. Yeah. Uh, I just want to do a quick point before I pass it off to Varun, who has another question. Uh, uh, we actually had um, Jess Carre from Overtime uh, as one of our oh, speakers awesome. uh, a couple days ago, and she was talking about how Overtime is emphasized so much. It's on going the up, too. Game. Yeah, and it's interesting because for overtime, they they kind of focus on these personalities. Like, for instance, they have a show with Mikey Williams, the high school player, and Mikey that's like one of the overtime's biggest hits. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, interesting to see how NBA, the actual people, the actual league that's developing this content, uh, uses social media in a different in a different sense. And, and, um, and overtime is a big part of like we're trying to work with them to help kind of push forward this new G League initiative of having this. Um, professional pathway team because obviously they have they have the eyes and ears to the streets of all these top high school players yeah. and obviously they're a content factory and are crushing it so we're trying to kind of work with them to, to help generate buzz and popularity for what we're trying to do no definitely yeah it's interesting how all these different leagues and brands are working together uh, I just yeah. want to pass it off to Varun real quick yeah so I was wondering um, like some people I think like some teams like not even in basketball but like they have like more than like one sponsor um, and, like, I know with the NBA, like, adding, like, I guess, like, all different sponsors to their jersey, um, like, have other sponsors always, like, tried to kind of, like, approach the NBA until adding, like, more, like, sponsors, um, like, onto the jerseys? Yeah, so I, I think there's there's two ways to go with that question. One, teams are different than the league, right? So, like, for example, we have a partnership with Pepsi, but the Hawks, have a partnership with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola's in Atlanta. It makes sense. But that doesn't stop them from doing that. Um, from our perspective, there are teams that have, like, you see these jersey patches that we've now allowed. You can only have one team jersey patch on your, uh, on your uniform. From our perspective, though, in terms of doing deals, we, at the end of the day, right, like, we want to make as much money as we can. So any way we can enable and figure out the language to – make a partner make sense, we, we will do. But like some brands, for example, will have exclusion. So this is stuff that like I've I've learned that, I mean, this stuff you wouldn't know otherwise. So like, so let's, let's say for example, uh, a, 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 a Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo would say, hey, you wanna be the official banker of the NBA, but we also wanna block you from, when we do this deal, we wanna block you from doing any type of other deal. So let's say that they're just for the NBA. We want to block you all from doing deals with other financial partners with the WNBA, G League, USA Basketball, the 2K League. I mean, they can do that. They pay enough money. But they can say, yeah, so we're going to be the only financial partner. You can't do a credit card partnership. You can't do a mutual fund partnership, whatever it may be. So there are different languages 
in these agreements that the lawyers deal with, again, people way above my pay grade and know way more than I do um, that have to deal with this type of stuff. But there's certain partners that have um, uh, like veto rights and exclusion rights within our partnerships that don't allow us to do certain things. So we try to we try to go after every little thing we can possibly go after. Um, but sometimes as you as you get more into the a partnership, you're like, oh wait, damn, we can't do that because State Farm has that. Damn, we can't do that because Nike has that. Exxon Mobil has that, right? So we, we we try to be creative in it, but it's it's a good problem to have, right? It means that we have a lot of partners in a lot of different spaces with paying us a lot of money, but then in day two, still we need to come up with revenue and we need to hit a certain number. So we try to find any way we can to make sure we integrate a partner that, that both they're happy with and we're happy with, and it doesn't infringe on current existing partners. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, we just have a we just have a couple minutes left, so I just wanted to um, hear more about your views on the NBA season itself. Uh, I, I I'm getting the understanding that you're a big Hawks fan. Like, whoa, how do you feel about um, DeAndre Hunter being on your on your guys' squad? Are you kidding me? Yo, let me tell y'all a story actually that you'll like. Um, <laughs> so at draft, I was working draft and. Uh, I got Woj, if you all who follow Adrian Wojnarowski. Oh, yeah. Woj was. Bottoms. He, 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 he finds shit now, right? way before you can even blink, which is cool. Now, given this restart, I've seen stuff that 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 that, that he hasn't seen. So, when he tweets it, like, two days later, I'm like, ah, so this two days earlier than you did. But anyways, um, so uh, Woj tweeted that Atlanta traded up with the Lakers to get the fourth pick of the draft. And saw that, went over to DeAndre's table, it was just him and his agent. I was like, yo, like, I'm like, Russell. Um, he was looking at me like, who the hell are you? Like, why are you talking to me? I don't know you. It's like, I went to UVA. He was like, oh, no. now he was locked in. Went to UVA. I was like, man, I was back for Black Alumni Weekend. It was 2016 Final Four Weekend. And, of course, the time, Starlesville was wild that weekend. And uh, I was like, yo, I was so ready to be back there. Like, obviously, you have nothing but love for you. I was like, look, as an NBA employee, I don't know what's happening. I can't tell you what's happening. But I saw y'all traded. I saw the Hawks traded up from Atlanta. Love to have you. We'll see. Um, he was like, he was like, look, like I would love to go to Atlanta. I was like, I, I already loved you. Now I love you more. Um, so we talked for a little bit, and it's funny. Like right before the draft started, um, there was a there was a girl who works for the NBA who was escorting different people to like different tables, and so she she's not a huge huge basketball fan. So she was like, oh. Michael would know this question. So she walks up to Tony Bennett and says, Michael, where's DeAndre's Hunter's where where is DeAndre Hunter's table? She knew DeAndre Hunter was. I was like, oh my god, it's Tony Bennett. I'm, i was oh more star. I think I've met pretty much any player under the sun. I think I was more starstruck to see Tony Bennett than I have been seeing so many other people. So I saw really? Tony and I was like, oh my. She's like, you need to walk with DeAndre Hunter's table. I was like, Tony, look, man, I went to UVA. I'm a big fan. Like you made me so happy. March, like, blah, 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 we're talking. He was like, of course, gracious, like, thank you so much. Like, I'm glad to show love. So I'm just talking. Then he goes, all right, okay, um, where's Dre's table? I was like, oh, right, I was supposed to take you to the table. Sorry, um, his, his table's actually this way. He was so fed up with me talking. He's like, look, I didn't come here to talk to you. I came here to see DeAndre Hunter get drafted. Get out of my face. <laughs> so took him to DeAndre's table. And um, that was just a cool experience as I had never met Tony nor I met DeAndre. But it's cool now, like, through just different touch points in the NBA, got a chance to know DeAndre, and uh, we kept in touch. Really, dude, I've, I've kept in touch a lot, really. I'm Malcolm Brogdon is from Atlanta, so I, I grew up with him and played yeah. basketball with him. Like, that's the homie. Really? So it's cool to, like, keep in touch with these guys as they go through their careers, especially the UK guys, because obviously that, that connection is there. But – um. Long story short, very excited that DeAndre is uh, is playing for my team. And I have a DeAndre Hunter jersey in my closet as we speak. Really? That's awesome. Yeah, I, I actually um, – De DeAndre Hunter came uh, – DeAndre, Kyle, Ty, they all came for their ring ceremony uh, uh, this past – like uh, during the fall semester. So I like – me and my friends, we kind of like snuck down to where they were doing it uh, after the event ended. And, we, and I, I got to meet DeAndre. He was like he was a super super nice dude. Though. Yeah, super was, quiet. Doesn't say much, but good dude. Yeah, I know. Great. Yeah, uh, I, I was gonna ask. Uh, so you so you mentioned how you've met uh, almost all all the players uh, that you've been interested in. Like, uh, could you uh, talk about like one unique experience with um, meeting like a big time player in the NBA? Yeah, um, I can tell you the first time I met LeBron. Uh, I first? was 
I was sitting, this was, they were coming off of practice for the All-Star game in New Orleans in 2017. It was like a tunnel of players coming by. So it's just, it's also weird to see, like when you see people on TV for so long, to see them in person, it's just really weird to see them in person. Yeah. And, um, and so I was standing next to some guy who called LeBron's name and LeBron took, well, oh, actually two stories. And LeBron bumped into me on the way to jack this guy up. The girl was up and they were chatting for a while. Like, oh, my bad, bro. I didn't even see you there. And then we just, like, we talked for, like, literally, like, 30 seconds. And I was like, oh, yeah, like, hey, like, how's Austin? Like, oh, how's All-Star been treating you? And uh, my, uh, my name's Mike. I don't, I don't know. Like, I was just talking about random stuff. Um, and the following day, it was a special Olympics game that we had at All-Star. And Steph Curry threw out um, through the opening tip. And once he was done, uh, I didn't even realize I was looking at my phone. And he was standing right next to me. And he was like, yo, man, like, how's everything going? And I was looking at my phone. I looked up. I was like, you can't be talking to me because he obviously know him being from me. Look back at my phone. He's like, yo, how's everything going? Like, oh, you talking to me? He was like, yeah. I was like, oh, uh, I mean, just working, bro. Like, enjoying New Orleans, whatever. And we got a chance to chat for a little bit. And um, he was just so nice. Like, literally, all, all the players that I've, that I've come across and met, obviously, LeBron and Steph are like, Two you think are are the most popular in our in our league and have been um, absolutely phenomenal to me and the other players that I've met have been very gracious and uh, and, and and very nice and um, yeah I mean it's just it's been it's, it's it's been a dream come true to get a chance to meet some of these people get to know some of these personally like through work like I've, I've actually gotten to know like Trey Young very well which is Dope. That's awesome. Fan. I'm like, yeah. wait, I actually I actually have this guy's cell phone number in my phone. And I can hit him up when he drops 50 as an auction like that. That's blows crazy. my mind. And honestly, I mean it's it's a, it's a blessing, man. But also too, like we have to we walk a fine line because we can't fanboy out, right? We yeah. can't be like, oh my god, LeBron, like if you see an elf when he sees Santa, I can't be like, oh Santa's here, like oh my god, I'm freaking out. Like I I mean I, I would get fired from my job. So you have to kind of um got to kind of keep a low profile, but of course, like once you get to know, at the end of the day, they're people, right? You get to talk to them, get to rap with them, like hear, hear them out, yeah. and they get to hear you out. Um, it's all love, and uh, that's that's been one of the really cool things uh, about my job. No, no, it was, it was great, to, great to hear from you. Thank you so much again for this event. I just wanted to throw out, um, ask you real quick, do you have any um, takers on who's going to win the league uh, once the I, I, when we started the season, I said the Clippers and I'm going to stick with that. So the Clippers, I got, yeah, I got the Clippers. I'm not, I'm not able to, After to the up the for obvious reasons. Um, but I got, I, 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 if I was a betting man and I could, if I was allowed to bet on the NBA, I would uh, bet on the Clippers. I also saw one comment in the chat real quick about uh, yeah. Spalding and Wilson. Um, Wilson paid us as much as I can say significantly more than Spalding. So um, we, but it's interesting because Spalding manufactures our backboards and Spalding logo is on our backboard. If you go and look at NBA backboards, it's like the bottom right corner. But we're trying to figure out now, can we sell the backboard? Can we now have beats yeah. on, on our backboard? Um, now that Spalding potentially won't be making it. Um, so long story short, Wilson paid us a lot more. And it's crazy. Wilson, I think, was the official ball of the NBA for like 40 years. And Spalding was the official ball for the NBA for like 41 years. And now it's switching back off to Wilson, which is wild how history kind of happened. Sorry. No, I mean, no, that's great. That's great insight as to like how almost uh, you can you can commodify almost every part of the NBA league. Yeah. NBA court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if, if you pay the right amount. Yes.